Yeah, we can wait, absolutely. We can wait, absolutely wait. But Subhash, maybe um, the Facebook Live that takes a couple of minutes to go on, you, Yatinder can decide when to make it live on Facebook. I In the meantime, I, I get a glass of water for myself. Please, please. Just one second. I'm starting the live. Yeah. Okay, please. Oh, dear. <clears throat> So uh, we're starting now, Professor Stacks up. Are we ready? Yeah, 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 ready. The, okay. the Facebook okay. live has started and then uh, then we can start. Yes, 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 please. Uh, 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 good evening, everyone. The, this is uh, Subhash Gatade. I belong to New Socialist Initiative, an ideological political platform and welcome you all to the 21st lecture in the Democracy Dialogue series. Uh, our guest this evening is Professor Ishtiak Ahmed, Professor Emeritus of uh, Political Science, Stockholm University, and a leading authority on the politics of South Asia, and an eminent author. We are really thankful to him for accepting our invite and sparing time for us. Born in Lahore on 24th of February, 1947, Professor Ishtiak Ahmed is a, at, at present honorary senior fellow at the Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore, where he worked as senior research fellow during 2007-2010. During 2013, to, 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 uh, he taught winter semesters at the Lahore University of Management Studies and at Government College University of Lahore. He has published several books with special focus on the politics of South Asia, discussed in context of regional and international relations. His book, The Punjab Bloodied, Partitioned and Cleansed, unraveling the 1947 tragedy through secret British paper reports and first person account, has won best nonfiction book award at Karachi as well as Lahore Literary Festival, and has also been published in Urdu, Hindi, as well as Gurumukhi. His latest book is Jinnah, his successes, failures and role in history, which has been brought out by Penguin. He has contributed extensively to peer-reviewed journals and chapters to edited books. He writes columns in several Pakistani newspapers. He is the editor-in-chief of the Liberal Arts and so Social Sciences International Journal. Currently, he is working on a new book, The Partitions of India, Punjab, and Bengal, Who and What and Why. This evening, he will be enlightening us on the topic of partition. Many of you would recall that this is the third lecture in the series on partitions. We had Professor Pravez Hudboy uh, in October beginning. He, before he talked about partition of India, three outstanding questions. Then we had Dr. Vinod Mumbai, public intellectual and scientist, who talked about partition split us up. Can we live peace in, as neighbors? And today we have Ishtia Kamasab, who will be discussing the two nation theory, partition, and the consequences, wherein he further intends to take up the two nation theory as an idea, as an argument, and wants to understand and evaluate partition as a historical, political, ideological, and intellectual phenomenon. Before I invite Professor Ishtiak to share his ideas, 
I would like to add that Comrades Ravi Sina as well as Comrade Bhargav will help facilitate the discussion after Professor Ishtiak's top presentation. Friends, please welcome Professor Ishtiak Ahmed. Uh, thank you very much, Comrade, for this, these very generous words about me. And, and I would like to thank the new socialist initiative network, all the comrades there. My heartfelt thanks for inviting me for this talk. And uh, I hope to discuss with you the two nation theory partition and the consequences, keeping in mind how we from the left need to assess it, need to revisit our own positionings on the freedom struggle and uh, reviewing the current situation. What has been the fallout of the revolution, of the, of the partition? As a preliminary, I would say that what is happening today in India is, is very much a continuation of the underlying logic of the two nation theory. And uh, while in Pakistan, that was given constitutional recognition. In India, you do have a constitution which you mentioned, which stands in the way of, of the two nation theory. So thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, very briefly, it is worth looking at what is a nation, you know. The way I look at a nation, it's a group of people claiming special rights to a territory on which they demand sovereign rights, or they may even be convinced to accept maximum autonomy. And so it is not to be confused with other cultural groups like a religious community or an, an ethnic group, or a biradri and so on. It's when the people start claiming that they have a special association with the territory and, and want to establish their own sovereign power over it, that I think a claim for nationhood uh, is made. Uh, Since India is a continuous civilization going back several millennia, one problem in looking at the whole idea of whose India it is would be who are its original inhabitants. And we already have revisionist theories about uh, the Hindus being indigenous to the subcontinent and the Muslims being invaders and so on and so forth. Uh, so these ideas have been around for a long, long time. There is no denying that both in Hinduism and Islam were developed comprehensive worldviews with their own internal ideas of justice to each his due. And the dharma karma theory defined how justice worked among Hindus. And with regard to Muslims, it was that it would be in the next life that you will be either rewarded or damned for what you did on this earth. But Neither Hinduism, nor Islam, nor European society until about the 19th century was against the whole idea of hierarchy. So accepting hierarchy as the natural way of organizing society and living with it was generally accepted by intellectuals. It's only, I think, with Marx that this whole way of thinking was subverted. 
where, where he questioned if there was a natural hierarchy built into the nature of humankind. And, and with his theory of class struggle and classes and the antagonisms and so on, uh, he turned upside down the whole argument saying that the injustice was that the laboring people are denied their rights while those who have the state power at their disposal they draw they draw most of the benefit uh, so if we are going to look at the freedom struggle we have to see what sort of arguments were put forth uh, for demanding equal rights for a certain group, group of people or for the whole population uh, of India. And I would say that uh, there are two basic approaches on, on nationalism and the nation. Uh, under which can be subsumed many variations of, of these two models. And the, and the first model is the French model called the civic model uh, or the territorial model where the French, after the French Revolution, the idea of civil rights belonging to men of property was proclaimed and, and uh, anybody living on French territory or territories was declared French and they were even assimilated into the French nation by the teaching of, of, of the French language. The virtue of the French model was that it included everyone, irrespective of their religion and, and, and their ethnic backgrounds and so on, in principle, although in practice, we know that it took a long, long time before it became truly universal. I've said it's only after 18, sorry, 1945, that this whole notion of a universal state democratic, liberal, inclusive, and pluralistic has, been become, has become part of the world order after the UN Charter was proclaimed. But the original idea that people who live on the same territory, men on the same territory at least, uh, irrespective of their ethnicity and so on, in principle belong to the same nation. So there is the French model, which is inclusive, which is territorially bound, and which recognizes all bona fide citizens, uh, parts of the population, as equal citizens. The second approach is the Teutonic Germanic model, which actually was a reaction to the French Revolution, where Napoleon uh, in the name of the Enlightenment and French values went around on a conquest uh, mission in Europe, even in Asia. And in reaction to that, among Germans' idea, the, the idea developed of, a, of the Germans being a special people, their speciality being their language and their culture. Originally, these were quite harmless ideas, but there was a discrepancy or incongruence between who was German and who was not in terms of territory. German nationalism, based on the collective group called the Germans sharing a common descent, culture, language, and so on, did not include ethnic minorities like Jews and the Roma people. And we know the consequences, finally, of such an approach. I would say that if we look at the 
freedom struggle which emerged in, in the subcontinent. 1857, we all know and what happened. Then after 1858, 1st November, uh, after the proclamation of Queen Victoria, where India was declared a, a crown colony, uh, the idea was that uh, more and more Indians would be included in the running of the of the empire in India, and uh, so it's in that framework Lord Macaulay's contribution to have Indians educated in the Western ways and so on that we find. Uh, consciousness of being part of a great nation started emerging in the educated middle classes. And uh, I would say that the Indian National Congress represented this sentiment that if the British were to rule India, they should rule in cooperation with Indians. And, and uh, so the Indian National Congress became a platform for people demanding more and more representation as loyal citizens of the British Empire. We know that this was not acceptable to the conservative sections of, of the British establishment in London as well as in India. They thought Indians were unfit for representative government and, and uh, they needed British uh, uh, control all the time in order to remain peaceful and so on and so forth. Uh, but we know that once the Indian National Congress was formed, although we also know it was a loyalist organization. But from the beginning, it tried to include all sections of Indian population. And we have Badruddin Tayyabji, a Muslim from Bombay, being elected president. And then another Muslim from Bombay, uh, Siani. Tayyabji was a Bora Ismaili, Bora Shia and Siani was a Bo Sunni Bora. So these were the two uh, early Muslim leaders who, who joined, uh, who, who, who were in favor of an emerging nascent proto Indian nationalism. As compared to this, we had an apprehensive Muslim minority which since 1857 was worried about an India without the British. Let me point out, and this is important because while looking at all these origins of things, one tends to inadvertently start playing the blame game and that's not my intention. When Sir Sayyid uh, started saying that Hindus and Muslims were two nations uh, after having for a while suggested that the two, when he used the word qom, uh, it, he meant Hindus and, 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 and Muslims, but later on he changed that uh, in the wake of the Hindi-Urdu controversy of 1880s. While Sir Sayyid, uh, you know, can be identified among Muslims who, who found the Indian National Congress uh, a, a new body which would represent Hindu interests and he tried to dissuade Muslims from joining it. In Bengal, uh, Professor Partha Ghosh published an article where he says that in 18... If, 80, 80, 80, sorry, 1858, 
भारत दर्शन इतिहास वॉज पब्लिश एज द फर्स्ट एंटी मुस्लिम मैनिफेस्टो द ऑथर आई थिंक वॉज तरन चरण चट्टोपाध्याय एंड लेटर ऑन राजा नारायण बोस started promoting this national nationality promotion society for the bengali bhadra lok so if we keep the indian national congress as a platform where uh, all indians were welcome we do find oppositional forces also active in these two groups in india at that time at the turn of the 20th century i think the percentage of the muslim population was less than 24% uh, they were uh, in a in a slight majority in north western and north eastern parts of the subcontinent but they were dispersed everywhere and not in a majority but historically they had been the the uh, uh privileged ruling class having served the mogul empire and and uh, even after the british took over up in 1837 they continued to enjoy that patronage until the 1880s when uh, in up the hindi the demand for hindi being uh, replacing urdu as the state language at the lower levels was expressed but let me point out that in a democratic sense the demand in the up was made sense because about only 14% of the population of up was muslim but about 70% of government jobs uh, during the mogul period and the early part of the british rule in up were with the muslims they were over represented in the police uh, so demanding that hindi should replace urdu was a popular demand of the hindu intelligentsia uh, which sir sayed found inimical to the interest of the muslim aristocracy of northern india who had benefited during this period so what we find is that while this idea of a one indian nation represented by the indian national congress began to emerge uh began to evolve among muslims and even among hindus there were reactions uh, it is worthwhile pointing out that there was a muslim group who because of pan islamism kept away from all this and they were worried about what the british were doing to the last uh, uh symbol of muslim power and that was the ottoman empire which was uh, shrinking fast in europe in eastern europe in central europe so they were in favor of joining hands with any indian people to oppose british rule but the party which was emerging at the center was the indian national congress and and so the two nation theory remained it was in the air in lahore in 1888 we have evidence of muhram ali chishti a leading uh, journalist writing about the need to establish an islamic state in northwestern india so some of these ideas of partitioning the subcontinent were already there also in the 19th century among sections of the hindus there was this fear that once the british are gone the muslims of india would join hands 
with the Hindus, with the Muslims of West Asia. And once again, uh, the enslavement of India will begin. So the way to deal with this was to reconvert uh, such Muslims to Hinduism, it was called, I think, the Shuddhi movement, or to drive them west of the Indus. I have given all this evidence in my in my book on the Punjab partition, as well as I think in the Jinnah book, some of these authors and thinkers have been mentioned. So the idea of a nation and of equal rights and so on, if we are to classify the emerging standpoints, then we find that it's in the Indian National Congress that ideas of individual citizens, irrespective of their religion, caste, and so on, uh, became a part of their uh, uh, basic declaration. Whereas communalist or community-based organizations uh, took negative positions on, on, on such an approach uh, to relations with the British who were then the ruling power. Uh, I think the turning point was 1905 when Bengal was partitioned by Lord Curzon on grounds that uh, it was unwieldy and, and uh, therefore breaking it up into two would be administratively useful and it would be also uh, generate more revenues for the British government. Out of it came the first reaction of the Bhadra Lok and, and uh, what subsequently happened is that uh, the Indian National Congress, which had a very large representation of Bengalis as well as Maharashtrians, uh, they came out against the partition of, of, of Bengal and uh, the Muslim aristocracy based in West Bengal initially uh, was in two minds how to deal with it because while Bengal was partitioned, they still remained in the privileged part of Bengal. But it was in East Bengal that the Nawab of Dhaka and, and Muslims who were in a the majority there, after a while uh, felt that they benefited from the partition of Bengal. The first terrorist attacks then against the British started with the Bhadra Lok. And, and uh, out of it then comes the annulment of the partition of, of uh, Bengal in 1911. But before that happened, the British in order to balance the emerging uh, competition between Muslims and Hindus carried out a number of uh, uh, changes, constitutional changes, which are which are worth mentioning. In 1906, uh, Muslim notables, mostly landlords. Let me point out here, because we are into this left sort of way of looking at things, the way things were in terms of education, business, uh, industry, commerce, uh, it was the Hindus who had taken positively to, to these new openings which the British colonial capitalist sort of economy introduced. And the Muslims had uh, reacted to that because for them, Western education would mean becoming Christians. I mean, this we know for a fact, this is what the ulama were preaching. Uh, in, in Punjab and in many other parts of, of India. And a capitalist economy in which you borrow and invest and so on also did not go well with the Islamic notion of 
in trust being forbidden by the Quran. So in terms of development opportunities, the Hindu majority uh, upper caste people were the ones who, who moved forward uh, in this sort of situation. And they were also the ones who were uh, in the Indian National Congress, largely speaking. So in 1906, Sir Sayyid had died, I think, in 1998. And, and But his followers and that group of thing, people that cooperate with the British, opposed the Indian National Congress, was still very strong. So in 1906, a British loyalist, Sir Aga Khan, led a delegation of the Muslim notables. The Muslims of India were either big landlords or they were peasants and artisans, but educationally they were behind the Hindus and uh, they weren't to be found in any significant numbers in commerce or, 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 or in, in industry. So these sort of uneven development of, of communities is also important to keep in mind how the dynamics of the two nation theory developed. But my main argument is that at the center of it, what was opposing all, all this, you know, the separatist sort of tendencies was the idea that all Indians belong to one nation. And, and it was the French model that the Indian National Congress had adopted. And if we can keep that in mind, so in 1906, this delegation meets the Indian Viceroy, Lord Minto. Uh, the, the statement they had prepared was already approved by the British, apparently Lord Morley, Secretary of State. And it demanded that uh, the Muslims of India uh, were should be given great importance because of their martial status and that they were uh, located in the sensitive areas of the subcontinent. And in an open free elections, they stood no chance to get elected. So the British granted in 1909 separate electorates to Muslims, uh, which also included weightage. Now, many of us believe, and I am one of them, that whether the Brit for the British this was some sort of maintaining justice between two groups, or it was a very clever move to separate Muslims from the rest of the Indian communities. It's a moot point. In practice, it proved to be very useful to keep the Muslims separated from the rest in terms of the freedom struggle. But uh, as we go along, we will see that uh, that didn't deter the Indian people, including Muslims, from trying to find ways of forming a common front for greater rights, self-rule, dominion status, and finally independence from the British. 1909, after this was uh, granted, then in 1919, a new act was introduced, uh, which introduced diarchy, which is uh, in at the provincial level, uh, the governments were partly elected, but the of the, the the portfolios given to them were not very strategic ones. Most of them remained with the governor and the governor appointees. But in Punjab, uh, the six were granted separate electorates. Now I think granting separate electorates and weightage is important for how this game of, of representation was played out in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, I think it's important, I, although I, I, I had decided not to look at the Lucknow pact, but 
it's worth considering what the Lucknow Pact of Muhammad Ali Jinnah had proposed. Jinnah, as we know, started as a diehard Indian nationalist and uh, was backed by the Indian National Congress to cultivate the Muslim League, even to join the Muslim League so that the followers of Sayyid could be isolated and the Muslims and the Hindus could be brought together uh, to demand self-rule. And, and uh, the Lucknow Pact, uh, to which both the Muslim League and the Indian National Congress agreed, granted almost double representation to Muslims in all Hindu majority provinces. But in Bengal and in Punjab, where Muslims were in a majority, their majorities were reduced uh, to, to just balance this idea of uh, representation. And, and let me point this out, that when this happened in Punjab, the leaders, the Muslim leaders there, Sir Fazle Hussain, Sir Muhammad Shafi, and Alama Iqbal, they all came out very strongly against the Lucknow Pact. Because the Lucknow Pact was something Jinnah could win in the interest of the Muslim minority, minority of the minority provinces. But having done that, and having defended that, then we enter the era of mass politics and Mahatma Gandhi joining the political scene. And, and that transforms Indian politics and the freedom struggle. 1915, when uh, uh, Gandhiji returned to India, uh, according to Stanley Walpott, the most famous biographer of Jinnah, uh, a reception was arranged by the Gujarati speaking people where Jinnah Saab presented the welcome address, which was very warm, very laudatory for what the Mahatma had done for Indians while in South Africa. Uh, but when Gandhiji got up to address the gathering of these Gujaratis, he reportedly said that I'm greatly pleased to see a Mohammedan leader on the same platform as we all others. And, and Walport says that uh, for Jinnah, this was a demeaning sort of statement because for him, Jinnah considered himself an all India level leader. And whereas Gandhiji was reducing him just to a Mohammedan leader. I mentioned this because I think when we talk about left politics, we have a tendency of looking at the mass and the classes and so on. Uh, whereas the fact is that uh, leadership is crucial to all stages of politics. And in my Jinnah book, I've even uh, quoted and relied a lot upon Plekhanov, the founder of Marxism in, in Russia before Lenin became the leader, uh, where he talks about the role of a leader, but saying that it has to be understood in the, in the context of the objective circumstances. Leadership, qualities, determination, their skills, they do matter, but they become effective only under a set of circumstances which are conducive to them uh, uh, advancing with their uh, agendas and so on. So <clears throat> what happens then is that uh, on another occasion, I think uh, at a meeting of the Indian National Congress, Jinnah Saab was uh, heckled by 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 people because he spoke in English, and and the followers of uh, Gandhi ji are reported to have said, speak in, in 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 Gujarati. He spoke a few words, but then resorted again 
to to uh, gujarati but this is all in the background the crucial thing is 1919 in 1919 when uh, the first world war was over and during the first world war indian support for the war had been very impressive lots of donations 2.5 million volunteers had joined the indian army of which more than a million were just punjabis the british instead of rewarding indian loyalty and donations and so on uh, with some advances in self rule they came they claimed the rahul attacks giving the government arbitrary powers to arrest people on mere suspicion uh, that they wanted to overthrow the legitimate british government of india of course there are two examples of armed revolution or if you want to call it uh, uh, violence being used by the indian people one is the bhadralok violence during 1905 1911 and then in punjab you have the ghadar party doing it but both were crushed by the british so there was no credible basis for uh believing that there was some grand conspiracy being hatched uh by indians to overthrow uh british rule although one can mention that in kabul a government and exile had been formed by uh, you know an, an assortment of indians including people with uh, leftist backgrounds and and nationalists and and i think one of the rajput uh, uh, notables was declared the prime minister or the president of this government in exile a famous muslim molana baidullah sindhi was one of the ministers uh, but that also was no government which could have uh, really launched a a a war on british india so the rahul attacks then followed by the jallianwala bag tragedy followed uh, by the khilafat movement and and in i know in india the khilafat movement is now assailed as gandhi ji's great uh, sin in in empowering uh, muslim fanatics uh i of course do not agree with that because i have a book with me of som anand a hindu from lahore who says that it is only when the khilafat movement idea emerged that in in lahore and in punjab hindu muslim fraternity sort of developed uh, of course the mopla uprising and all we can't go into that today but uh, that was a negative impact it wasn't on the agenda of the khilafat movement the khilafat movement the muslims went to gandhi ji and not the other way around and i have said that suppose gandhi had refused to support the muslims then he would be accused of being a of of being a hindu leader of a communalist who did not support his fellow indians about an institution they felt very strongly about and that is that the ottoman empire should have control of the holy sites of islam makkah and medina and baghdad and so on uh, but he did it in good faith in the hope that after 1909 since the british had the muslims had been separated from the freedom struggle this was a good way of bringing them back into the fold of 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 uh, of a united front of all indians but within the congress also there was criticism of the khilafat uh, movement and so on and and the non cooperation that he launched uh, but that's the point where jena then breaks from the indian national congress 
and and uh, I would say that uh, from there onwards begins the era of communitarianism. That's when uh, within India, still ruled by the British, the efforts were to convince the British to grant them more and more self-rule. And uh, in this regard, I would say that uh, uh, Jaswan Singh and the BJP and many others have made a big point of blaming Jawaharlal Nehru for the Nehru report and, and for subverting the Lucknow Pact. I have argued that this is not true at all. Uh, in 1924, at Lahore, when the Muslim League met, uh, they adopted demands which were outside the scope of, of uh, the Lucknow Pact. They demanded that in Punjab and, and Bengal, the Muslim majorities should be maintained, while in the Hindu majority provinces, the one third or 100% increase should also be main, maintained. And they were in support of separate electorates. So here is a period where, you know, there is a competition between the Muslim League on the one hand and uh, the Indian National Congress on the other and the British in between trying to maintain their control over the subcontinent. I would say that uh, in, in 1928, when the Simon Commission, you see in 1919, a promise had been made that in the next 10 years, a constitution for India will be proposed. And so this commission had been sent an all white commission, which most of the leading Indian parties boycotted, including, you know, the Muslim League split on this. And uh, Jinnah and his faction rejected the Simon Commission, but Alama Iqbal and, and Sir Shafi and many others in the Punjab, uh, they accepted to, to cooperate with the Simon Commission. The Hindu Mahasabha opposed it as well. So the major parties had opposed it, but some loyalist Hindus, Muslims, and even Sikh organizations in the Punjab met the Simon Commission and, and so on. Uh, the British then uh, taunted the Indians by saying that they are incapable of agreeing on a constitution for India. And so uh, the Indian National Congress took up this challenge and uh, under the leadership or the chairmanship of Dr. Mukhtar Ahmad Ansari, a, a, a committee was formed which uh, invited all Indian parties, all the communist factions, all the ethnic parties like that of the Sikhs, Muslims, the Muslim League was invited, the Kali Dal and many other factions of the Sikhs were invited, the Parsi parties were invited, the Brahman parties, the anti-Brahman parties, the South Indian parties, you name a political party, none of them was excluded. And they were called in for brainstorming and to propose a constitution which would be acceptable to all Indians. Uh, <clears throat> Muhammad Ali Jinnah, at this point, decided to boycott the joining this committee on grounds that uh, his basic demands that separate electorates should be accepted and one third Muslim representation should also be accepted. Unless those are granted, he would not join such a 
to Meti. I have argued that this was a major blunder for Jena because had he taken part in the deliberations, he could have persuaded the committee to accept some of his demands which he wanted to make on behalf of, behalf of the Muslims. But two Muslim leaguers did take part in this. And one was Ali Imam and then Shweb Qureshi. Under what circumstances they decided to do it is not very clear. But there were many influential Muslims who, who took part in this uh, committee which was formed under in May 1928. Uh, uh, Originally, they met in February under Ansari. Then in 20, May 28, Motilal Nehru was made the chairman uh, of this committee. And uh, they heard all type of concerns. One thing was noticeable there that uh, the Hindu Masaba was always active that no concession should be given to Muslims. And and uh, so that must have been a factor, which if Jinnah had participated, he could have uh, countered it. But there was no one, no one there to to do that except the Congress leaders, who I think played their role very well. The Nehru report, then I would argue, uh, and I I can challenge that no Indian scholar has ever done a proper analysis of the Nehru report, neither the historians nor the political scientists. But uh, since I am basically a political scientist and I, I write about history because historians don't seem to look at the thick web of things and, 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 and political implications and political theory, how they impact politics in general. So I have in the Nehru report, uh, brought out its main points, and if if you permit me, I'll 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 India should be a dominion with a parliamentary form of government. There shall be no state religion. Men and women will enjoy equal rights as citizens. Elections will be based on universal adult franchise. Hindustani shall be the national language of India with two official scripts, Devanagari and the Persian Urdu scripts. English could also be used. There should be a bicameral legislature. I think this we can ignore. Uh, the governor general will act on the advice of the executive council. India shall be a federation with an effective center. The princely states will be part of the federation. There will be no separate electorates for minorities. The system of weightage shall not be adopted for any province. There will be no reserved seats for communities in the Punjab and Bengal. However, reservation of Muslim seats could be possible in the provinces where Muslim population were in a minority, but in strict accordance with the proportion of the population. Sindh should be separated from Bengal, provided it was feasible. I mean, this was the demand made by the Muslim League already in 1924. And in the final report, the people who prepared it are Motilal Nehru, Tej Bahadur Sapru, S. Ali Imam, Madan Mohan Malavia, Ani Besant, Mukhtar Ahmed Ansari, M. R. Jayakar, Abul Kalam Azad, Mangal Singh, M. S. Ani, Subhash Chandar Bose, Vijaygar Charyar, and Abdul Qadir Kasuri. Abdul Qadir Kasuri, incidentally, was the is the grandfather of uh, Pakistan's former uh, foreign minister Khushid Mahmood Kasuri, uh, who 
during the Musharraf Manmohan Singh negotiations, he came up uh, with the Kasuri plan, which basically means the line of control in Kashmir becoming the international border initially for 15 years and then on. Well, so I think this was important to, to, to say that the Indian National Congress, first of all, had become a mass party under Mahatma Gandhi. He had opened membership to all Indians. I think it was four on us membership uh, and it had become a mass party. The Indian, the All India Muslim League remained an elite party of only 1500 members of whom, of whom more than half did not pay their annual subscriptions. And it's only in 1937 that they opened the doors for ordinary Muslims to join the Muslim League. So you have an elite party uh, on the one hand representing just Muslim interests. How it became communalist is the is the stage that we will go to now. But uh, one can say like this that uh, during this period when communitarian negotiations were going on, the position taken by at least uh, Muhammad Ali Jena was that India was not one nation. He had repudiated the one nation idea and come up with this idea of multiple nationalities. Among the nationalities, he counted Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Dalits, and Dravidians. This is the way uh, he looked at the question of nationalities and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the Nehru report was proposing something where a secular state, liberal, democratic, was being proposed and universal adult franchise, the argument was that minorities and majority issue becomes redundant once you give each individual an equal right. Uh, a Brahmin and a Dalit become equal. A man and a woman become equal as citizens. So under what circumstance should a Muslim have one and a half votes as compared to a Hindu? It made no sense. And I think this was a perfectly sound argument. Also, it was laid down that while there will be Hindustani as the national language and English will continue, each province will have the right to teach and conduct its affairs in their own regional languages. So if you look at this framework, then what about the federation that was proposed, effective center? 39 items were given to the center and 67 items were given to the provinces. And these were substantive issues that were given to the provinces. It's in the book and anybody can go and examine it. Just before we move into the next, the next stage, uh, I would like to point out Jinnah's 14 points. The 14 points was a response to the Nehru report where the demand was that uh, Muslim representation in this uh, should continue to be one third. And in the provinces, in all, uh, uh, you know, governments, ministries, 33% uh, percent representation should be given to Muslims, which would apply even to uh, Madras where Muslims were only 7%. So that was another demand he made and that separate electors will continue. I have argued that the 14 points were a rejection of democracy. Uh, and so it, it to <laughs> A final point in 1929, the Muslim League met in Delhi to consider if they wanted to accept the Nehru report or not. And we have evidence now, which I've given in the book, that uh, there was 
a group of Muslim leaguers, mostly with the background in the Khilafat movement, who wanted to support the Nehru report. Not only that, but the main financier of the Muslim League, Raja Sab Mahmudabad, a close associate of Jinnah, also wanted to support the Nehru report. But while they were there in this meeting, and apparently a resolution was also adopted, uh, a pack of roughnecks, gundas came to the meeting. And one by one, people who were in favor of the Nehru report were uh, picked up and thrown out of the hall. And then Jinnah Saab came in and, and the Nehru report was rejected. So this is important to put on record because uh, in Pakistan, the Nehru report is considered to be the reason why the Muslims wanted a separate state because it had, you know, it had uh, denied Muslims their legitimate rights. And I, that makes no sense to me at all that Muslims should have one point one and a half rights when a Dalit and the Brahman would have one one vote and men and women will have one vote also. So that incongruent sort of thing made no sense to anyone who, who, who was thinking of democracy and democratic rights. No. After, after the failure of the Nehru report, then there is this round of roundtable conferences. There is this uh, incident of Bhagat Singh. Uh, the temptation is to go into all this because Bhagat Singh belongs to the left and so on. But I would rather leave it to a question from the audience if, if they are interested, but would focus on the mainstream freedom struggle which was going on. Uh, the British, uh, we know that the three round table conferences failed. Jinnah is on record in June 1929, writing a letter to the British Viceroy, uh, British Prime Minister, uh, Ramsay MacDonald, saying that I strongly urge you to grant India dominion status because otherwise the Indian National Congress is going to lead the struggle for complete independence and the people of India are with them. This Jena is admitting. But Ramsay MacDonald didn't pay any heed. There is no record of any response for, from Ramsay MacDonald. But we do know that Jena now was doing what Sir Sayyid had done long time ago to cultivate the British to counter the Indian National Congress. So we have to keep this triangle in mind. And, and I think in, if we now move pretty fast, I don't know how much time I've taken. I'm in a daze as well because I'm not, I'm running a fever, but as I talk, some new angle comes up and I, I, I like to put it before you and, and I know the dangers in doing that. So let me discipline myself. Please the elaborate, significant, sir. sorry? Please elaborate. Uh, no, no time limit. Please, please go. You can discuss in detail. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what we do now is that if you look at this triangle, India is still the British uh, for them, India was the jewel in the crown and there was nothing remotely suggesting that they wanted India to be even a dominion. This is, I've argued in the book, that from the British point of view, only white settler colonies could, be could have responsible governments. The Indians were unfit for it. And I've of course, quoted Churchill, who damns Hinduism. But I've also quoted ja uh, uh, Churchill, who damns Islam equally. 
and then of course you have dr ambedkar and his position on on these two religions there is so much we can take up but the interesting thing is that for me the nehru report was a workable practical framework for a constitution for all indians in which i think historically very significant changes had been proposed i mean in many parts of the world even in britain i think it's only in 1928 that the working class or universal adult franchise was introduced most of the world still didn't have women voting the soviet union granted women the right to vote i think 1917 and then uh, ataturk did it in 1934 but elsewhere uh, the french revolution granted the right to vote to women in only 1944 from 17 1789 property men get the right to vote until 1944 women also get the right to vote and switzerland gave the right to vote to women only in 1971 so already in 1928 if you look at this framework i think this was reflective of the anti imperialist ideas which were around the soviet union had created its own uh impact uh i'm sorry yaar somebody is calling me i i forgot to can i can i break up for a moment oh toba yaar you know i have this hearing aid so i can hear the telephone calling so anyhow the telephone is is now disconnected anyhow 1928 is over the three the round table conferences do not come up with a formula that can be acceptable to all then in 1932 uh, uh comes the communal award just before the communal award the british wanted to grant separate electorates even to the dalits and uh, we know what mahatma gandhi did then and dr ambedkar has never forgiven him for that and he says that he was forced into accepting the pune pact but i think many of us would argue that unlike the muslims who were in a majority in two parts of the subcontinent the dalits were everywhere in india the most despised sections of the population even if they lived among muslims by the way or among sikhs everywhere they were nowhere in a majority so uh, for the dalits only upward mobility was a possibility and the lucknow pact actually was very generous in 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 the reservations uh, which were granted to 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 the dalits uh, anyhow so the 1932 communal award doesn't then grant separate electorates to the dalits but it grants most of the demands of the muslim league for separate electorates and so on and so forth and and uh, then in 1935 finally we get the government of india act and i think this is where we can go fast because from uh, now onwards most of the things should be easier to follow uh, what i'm arguing thus far is that the indian national congress progressively had become a mass party had opened its doors to everyone and uh, but the 190 act did keep the muslims away from uh, the platform of the indian national congress but substantial number of muslims were still with the indian national congress including the khilafat leaders abdul ghafar khan ataulla shah bukhari and and uh, uh, allah bakhsh sumru and so many other people we can mention who were and they remained loyal and steadfast to the congress till the very end uh, so not all muslims were attracted 
to to this sort of separatist lobby of the of sir sayyad and then sir aga khan and so on and so forth 1935 act uh then the elections of 1937 where i think things move towards the partition that's where the partition idea moves from being a a marginal idea to a central idea in indian politics uh before we do that maybe it's worth mentioning that in 1930 alama iqbal at ilahabad had vaguely suggested the idea of a muslim state in northwestern india although when he was confronted by the british he came up with the argument that he only bent a, an autonomous muslim nation within the british empire and he was not looking for um, a muslim state outside the british empire uh, he is even on record saying that british rule in india is kept together by the support of the british of the muslim in the army and in the police i have quoted that speech as well in 1933 choudhry rehmat ali a punjabi from hosharpur at cambridge comes up with this idea of pakistan p for punjab a for afghania k for kashmir istan for sindh and balochistan and and now or never is the name of the pamphlet where they say that we have nothing in common with hindus we do not dine together we do not marry the heroes of one are the villains of the other we have different world views so on and so forth therefore we are not indians we are pakistanians this is the word he uses and we need a separate state for muslims i have argued in the jinnah book that if you look at iqbal's scheme it if such a state had been created it would apply only to 22 23% of the muslim population of the indian subcontinent and choudhry rehmat ali scheme equally they they didn't take into account bengal at all neither uh, iqbal nor or uh, choudhry rehmat ali whereas the greatest concentration of muslims was in bengal and of course then there were muslims die all over the indian subcontinent so this was a strange type of muslim nationalism which demanded equally the divisions of muslims uh so that's a contradiction which emerged in this idea of a two nation theory when the hindu right wing now says that if pakistan was created for muslims what are hindus doing muslims doing in india it's 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 an argument which although morally i would never accept but one can't say that the gut logic would still apply uh, that if pakistan was going to be the uh, state of the muslims based on the two nation theory then there should have been a complete exchange of populations which was never anticipated which was never envisaged i'm sorry to say but we come to that later let's not be in a hurry so 1937 elections are held we know that the congress sweeps the elections in the hindu majority provinces and gets a very strong mandate also from the most muslim province in the subcontinent that is the northwest frontier because of the khudai khidmat gars but in the rest of the muslim majority provinces of northwestern and northeastern india in punjab out of i think 75 reserve seats there were only two which became one when one of them crossed the floor in sindh the muslims were 70% 30% were hindus 29% the muslim league got not a single seat and of course northwest frontier provinces where muslims were 94% of the population 
the Muslim League didn't get a single seat. Balochistan at that time was not a province. It was ruled by a Shahi Jirga and, and then Kalat and so on. In Bengal, there were 114 reserved seats for the Muslims, of which the Muslim League won only 40. The rest were won by, I think, the Krishik Praja party of uh, Kazi Fazlul Haq and other factions. So the Muslim League had been exposed as a party without a strong support of, of the Muslims. And that's where I think the we as leftists have to be uh, very critical. Do people vote always in terms of their class interests? Ideally, yes. But I think if you look at how people are swayed by nationalism and religious passions, very often the class basis of commitment is overshadowed by all these identity appeals and passion-filled appeals and so on. So what happens is that uh, just before the election, Nehru had declared that we will zim abolish Zimidari and India will be recast in the shape of the Soviet type of development, that the Soviet model of development would be the basis for future India. When he did that, let me point out, many leading Congress leaders resigned from the party, including Dr. Rajendra Prashad, Raja, Raja Gopalacharya, Kriplani, Sardar Patel, and I may have been, but it was Mahatma Gandhi then who pleaded with them to come back. And in 37, then uh, in the next speech, uh, which Nehru made as president of the Congress, he tones down the socialist part of the future program for India and says, we will only work for democracy in India. What happened was that this played into the hands of uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who had a strong, who had a long grievance against the Congress. Uh, his 14 points had been rejected earlier. Uh, he had been hooted a, a number of times and so on. So now uh, he tells the governor of, Beng of, of Bombay that from now on, henceforth, I'm going to use communalism to arouse Muslim support against uh, Hindu domination. And then for the two years when the Indian National Congress was ruling in a number of provinces, you have Pirpur reports and Sharif reports, thick reports, especially the Sharif report, allegedly documenting the discrimination and persecution of Muslims, which actually was very successful propaganda because the Viceroy who was very pro Muslim League because the Muslim League had supported the war effort during the Second World War and the Congress had not, he's on record saying that I'll, I've looked at the evidence and I'll tell <coughs> Jinnah that none of his claims is substantiated. Three, four governors, British governors, very hostile to the Congress during the Congress ministries. They are on record saying that there is no evidence that the Congress governments were targeting Muslims in particular. But this propaganda somehow caught up very well. And Jena is on record saying that in a united India, Islam will be annihilated and Muslims will be obliterated. I mean, these are extreme slogans. And then if people start believing that the Muslims were persecuted, this idea caught up in other parts of the subcontinent where there were people who were willing to cooperate with the British, like the Punjab Unionist Party, but the Congress had put its foot down and Jinnah then moved in and, and uh, made a breakthrough in, in the Punjab uh, province 
up until then he was always on the peripheries and 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 so he was able to convince sir skandar hayat to enter into a pact with him where while in punjab the punjab unionist party intercommunal hindu muslim sikh combination would continue but at the central level the muslim league will represent the punjab unionist party that uh tactic of jena played in i mean he drew maximum benefit out of it because sir skandar died in december 1942 and then the punjab unionist party had its own internal leadership tussle sir khizar hayat tiwana who emerged as the leader was no match for jena and his uh, political machinations and whatever you want to call it and so the punjab was began to uh, was captured by by uh, jena the same happened in sindh where sir uh, uh, allah bakh sumru uh, who had opposed the muslim league to then nail he was assassinated in 1943 and after that the muslim league made a breakthrough even in sindh province uh, it's only in the northwest frontier that till the very end uh, the majority of the people in the parliament in their remained with the uh, congress government which was the khudai khidmatgar government uh, so if you look at this situation which is developing then i would say that 1940 Twenty second March is when the two nation theory finally, I've called it the foundational theory for the partition of India, is spelled out by Jena. I have gone, I have given the whole speech and then analyzed the speech. the The bottom line is exactly, I mean, what Ramat Ali had been arguing, but had been kept away by the Muslim leaguers. now jena adopted all his arguments without acknowledging that these were ideas of rahmat ali and he said we don't eat together we never marry we can't drink water from the same vessels we have different world views and i mean all those uh, uh, differences which existed and maybe with the re- religious revivals arya samaj and wahhabism and singh sabha the puritanical movements were also there so these ideas sort of caught up with the muslims who who began to be attracted to the idea of a separate state so the lahore resolution demands pakistan and uh, from 1940 till 19 47 i have said give me a single speech of jena where he says we want to have a power sharing deal with the indian national congress and there is none there is of course the cabinet mission plan where if somebody has a question i can respond to it but jena accepted the cabinet mission plan because that was the only option given to him otherwise the british were going to leave india to the congress as the congress wanted so that detail also is taken care of uh, now the problem is finally the british role and how do we look at the partition and its uh, fallout today the british i would say had no intention of leaving india in 1943 when the second last viceroy lord Wavell took over from Lord Linlithgow. Linlithgow told him, "We are here for another thirty years." That would have meant till nineteen seventy-three. But we all know that although the British won the Second World War, their back was broken by the the same war. Their industry was in tatters. There was food rationing, and they were. heavily under debt to the americans and the americans wanted the british to vacate india because 
up until then the monopoly for trade in the subcontinent was only with the with british industry uh, also i would like to emphasize that uh, franklin d roosevelt was still st strongly anti colonial in his convictions there was an anti british sentiment still very strong among the americans so under those pressures then we find uh the the muslim league gaining ground the congress commits another blunder you know first of all uh when the war broke out mahatma gandhi met lord lenlithgow and he said i would like to support this war and bombing of westminster would make me cry and so on the congress leadership uh chastised him for that and they said that they came up with a very intellectually convincing argument but i think in the totality of the political and situation and balance of power i think this was a mistake a major blunder and that is they said that how can we you say that you are fighting fascism for the freedom of the world if that is true how can we and enslaved people fight for the same freedom unless we are free so first make us free and then as a free nation we will decide to join the war against fascism but the british could not have let go india because they were that is why they had their recruiting ground for the british army a million soldiers mostly from punjab and of course other parts of india were recruited during the war and and so there was no chance they would do it so lilith go and jena then formed this front against the indian national congress and the congress commits another blunder i would say by launching the quit india movement the background of the quit india movement is that subhash chandra bose had been wanting armed revolution and you know and and the congress was not willing to do it and then he left the subcontinent went to russia then germany then uh, japan and so on and founded the indian national army so somehow in bengal there was a demand for a revolution and there was a feeling also that the japanese might be winning the war all these factors have to be taken into the reason why the indian national congress did agree to launching the quit india movement lilith go was able to crush it mercilessly and the congress leadership sat in in prison in jail from august 1942 till june 19 45 during during those three crucial years jena had a field day reaching to muslims of india uh, that uh, the creation of pakistan was the only guarantee for them that islam will survive uh, although he he uh, survival of islam Uh, and 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 so on uh, with a divided india had its contradictions and in 1941 on the 30th of march at kanpur he was confronted by the muslim saying that after the lahore resolution the place where you want to have pakistan is where there is already a pakistan in northwestern and northeastern india where all the elected chief ministers are muslims so what will happen to us and i quote jena saying that i'll have 2 crore actually he should have said 3 crore 30 million but he said 2 crore 20 million i'll have 2 crore muslims experience martyrdom and get smashed in order to liberate 7 crore from the yoke of hindu Uh, uh domination so even jinnah scheme of pakistan ultimately 
required the division of Muslims uh, between India and, and Pakistan. What about the British? How were they looking upon these schemes? For them, it was always interesting that Congress and the Muslim League were, were playing zero-sum games, not agreeing on anything. And Jinnah especially, uh, you know, rejected so many overtures from the Congress for some sort of reconciliation. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one example, not too many. I know the time factor uh, is, is so important. In 1938, Subhash Chandra Bose, as president of Congress, wrote to Jinnah saying that I, we do agree that the Muslim League is a major party of the Muslims, but we cannot ignore the fact that there are other Muslim parties as well. Like, for example, the Khudai Khidmat Gar and the Jimiyat Ulma Hind, the main party of Orthodox Muslims, which were supporting the Indian National Congress. And Jinnah says, well, you not only have to accept that the Muslim League is the sole party of the Muslims, but that the Indian National Congress is a Hindu party. Obviously, this is not an approach seeking a negotiated settlement or, or some give and take because while saying that the Muslim League was the sole party and until 1945, there was no election result to actually justify it, but to demand that the Congress also accepts that it is a Hindu party was too much. So it was a provocation. And I think this provocation goes on and on. And after the Second World War, Jinnah could feel that if he worked with the British, he might get Pakistan. The, the decision to partition India then is, let's come to that. This decision, I say, was reached very, very, very late. The British were hoping that India would remain united in a loose framework, one acceptable to the All India Muslim League, much against what the Congress wanted with an effective center, but that such an India would also be tied in a defense a treaty with the British against whosoever was, uh, whenever such a treaty needed uh, Indian support. And of course, the British were thinking of the Soviet Union. Uh, after 1830, they were into the great game. And after eight, 1917, the great game for the British had, had attained uh, uh, pathological levels when it became the Soviet Union. So the idea, the British military or establishment now had to consider that if India is partitioned, would that be in their interest to prevent Soviet advance towards the subcontinent or keeping it united would serve their purpose? Because a, a, a defense treaty was important even for the cabinet mission plan to be accepted. And what we know is that on the, on the 11th of uh, May 1946, uh, the Supreme Head of the Indian um, Armed Forces in the subcontinent, Sir Claude Auchinleck, prepared a memorandum for or against Pakistan, pro, con, pro, con. And he concludes that no, India should not be partitioned by main reason was that it would entail the division of the British Indian Army. The institution they had created to defend India against Soviet influence and so on. So that would weaken India. And uh, a partition India could also mean that if Pakistan was pro-Pakistan, pro-Britain, uh, uh, India could then lean towards the Soviet Union. So the best was to keep India united. But by 12th May 1947, 
one year, one day later, I have quoted a memorandum of the British three heads of state, uh, heads of the armed forces, Navy, Army, and Air Force, hero of the Second World War, Field Marshal Montgomery, Lord Ismay, and some other characters saying that if partition happens, we should demand from Pakistan Karachi port facilities, access to its airfields, and access to Muslim manpower, which means the Pakistan army. Mr. Jinnah has expressed an interest in joining the Commonwealth, whereas Hindustan may go its own way. You see, among the British, the suspicion was that Nehru and the people around him since 1936, with a leftist orientation, were not reliable. They might remain neutral as they did later on, or even join the Soviet Union as part of some anti-imperialist understanding. And therefore, the decision to partition India, finally, when the cabinet mission plan failed, was agreed. Its implementation is notorious and I don't think I have to go into the details, especially in Punjab, the loss of life, because if you give me another five minutes, this, this point is important to emphasize. When the Muslim League demanded the partition of India on the basis of religion, saying that in those areas where Muslims are in a majority should be separated to create Muslim states, sovereign and independent. One week later, Sardar Sundar Singh Majithia of the Sikh National Party came out and said, if the Muslims cannot accept India as their homeland, that we will ensure that those parts of the Punjab, which are not Muslim majority, are not do not become part of an Islamic Pakistan. And Master Tara Singh later on supported that as well. And in the 1945-46 election campaign, uh, while the Muslim League demanded a mandate from the Muslim voters for Pakistan, the Congress for keeping India united, the Sikhs demanded a mandate from uh, their reserved seats, you know, for the Sikhs, a mandate to demand the partition of, of, of Punjab. So ultimately, in the final 3 June plan, the, not only India was to be partitioned, but also Punjab and Bengal, if the two assemblies voted uh, for it. And the process was that both Punjab and Bengal assemblies would be split into two, Muslim majority districts, Hindu majority districts. And if either bloc voted for partition, the subcontinent will be partitioned. And of course, while Jena wanted the whole of India to be partitioned on the basis of religion, he wanted the whole of Punjab and Bengal. The Congress, which opposed the partition of India on the 8th of March 1947, came out supporting the Sikh demand for the partition of Punjab. And then in April 1947, the Indian National Congress came out in support of the Hindu Subhas, Mahasabha's demand for the partition of Bengal. Ultimately, both provinces were partitioned. Why Bengal didn't go through a bath, blood bath, but Punjab did, I have a lot to tell you about that. But maybe it's too well known to, to demand our attention. What we know now is that once partition took place, the Indian National Congress held steadfast to its idea of a secular India with equal rights for everyone. They had even included reservations after the Pune Pact. So all that is part of the Indian constitution. And they were not deterred by the Hindu Masaba and RSS in, 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 in expelling Muslims from India. Whereas in West Pakistan, which is Pakistan today, although Jinnah kept on saying we will take care of the minorities, 
had the Hindus and Sikhs remained in India, there would be 21% of the Pakistan population. But already by December 1947, that figure had gone down to 1.6%. They were either attacked or they ran themselves to save their lives. All of them left Punjab, Sindh, frontier in frontier after the uh, Khudai Khidmat guards were thrown out of power by Jinnah and Qayyum Khan came into power. The Hindus were attacked there. In Sindh, the same happened. And, and so at the end of the day, only 1.6% of the Pakistan population, West Pakistan population, remained Hindu. And that too, in Sindh interior, uh, the Hindus were to be found. And to this day, that percentage remains 1.6%. It was a terrible slaughter of people who, during this while, tried to cross the border. The tales are too shattering and too moving. But, you know, these things obviously uh, bequeathed a legacy of bitterness, hatred, dislike, which politicians since then have used to their advantage. I would say that the Congress erstwhile leadership did try to remain steadfast and, and loyal to their ideal. But with Pakistan emerging as an Islamic state and after the Afghan Jihad, though many people, you know, so-called non-state actors coming to the Indian Kashmir to liberate them, causing terrorism, the Mumbai attacks, Vajpayee Sahib coming to Pakistan, seeking peace, and Kargil happening, Narendra Modi coming to a private wedding at the Sharif's, immediately to be followed by the Pathan court thing, Pulwama and whatever. The result has been that all this has played into the hands of the, of the Hindu right who want India now to become a Hindu Rashtra. They say it's a Hindu majority state. So it would be secular in a Hindu way. Why don't you grant it? I'm one who is opposed to that because I think one of the most uh, uh, laudable achievement of the Indian freedom struggle was the constitution of 19 of 1946-47. And I hope we can all join hands in, in making it even stronger. And in India, maybe in, in Pakistan, at the moment, we don't know what will happen because Pakistan is an ideological state committed to Islamization. And in the name of Islamization, the persecution of minorities is so blatant I have nothing to say to explain away what has happened. Thank you very much. I'll I'll stop at this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I overstepped the limit. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Tiak Saab. Uh, very enlightening presentation for all of us. Many other the, the the issues you have raised really about the Nehru report, or you are giving a new light uh, to the to the whole partition debate also. So there would be many questions from the participants, but. First, I would request my senior comrade Ravi Sina to say a few words. Ravi. Thank you, Suvash, and thank you so much, Ishtiak Sahab. It has been such a wonderful talk, and we are so happy that you accepted our invitation. And I wish we could go back to our old leftist days when there was no time limit in our study circles, you know, and so on. But, you know, these days lectures have to have, you know, <laughs> these time limits. I wish you could go on and on. Um, uh, Subhash and Bhargo will pick up questions from our audience. There are many, many luminaries in our audience. And also there are questions on in the chat box. But just to start the discussion, um, <clears throat> And maybe in a way, giving you a few more minutes, you know, to um, take the uh, discussion forward. You know, the we we have been focusing on partition basically because we feel it impacts on today's politics. 
So our interest is, you know, how to deal with this Hindu Muslim divide that somehow exists in the society. And then if <clears throat> there is a divide, then there will be political forces to take advantage of it. So when um, we kind of grapple with the thing that could partition would have been avoided or is Hindu Muslim divide, you know, is creation solely of um, political forces, ideologues, politicians and so on, or there was something there in the society which under which we could, everybody could talk about Hindus and Muslims, Hindu people and Muslim people. So when did this Hindu Muslim being treated as different people, whether you could, I mean, we don't agree with that if Hindus and Muslims are two different uh, people belonging to two different religions, they don't get to a right to imagine two separate nations. You know, I mean, religions don't uh, equate with nations. But the fact remains that somehow this divide must have been there, which was then taken advantage of, as you pointed out, by forces like Muslim League and Jinnah. And now in India, this, this is being utilized by the present day rulers, RSS and Hindutva people and so on. So basically, the question is not really a question. It's really that we are back to the same wondering what could have been done and what should be done now if there is a if there, if there is a division in the society, some political force will take advantage of it. What should we do? Because we on the secular and progressive side end up saying very shallow, obviously right things, but shallow things. And they somehow are able to dig deep into the social um, tectonic plates and are able to gain uh, more ground than we who say the obviously right things, you know, secular and progressive and so on. So would you just take a few minutes and take, you know, your take on that, you know, between the subjective forces and the objective conditions in the old leftist language? <clears throat> uh, I would say like this, that, that people belong to different religious communities is a fact which is universal. And uh, historical memory, which is always selective, uh, also exists everywhere you, wherever you go. You know, I was uh, uh, watching this series on net, Netflix on, on the crown. And even in the 1960s, in the British royalty, this was being discussed whether they could trust a Catholic or not. So I'm talking not about America where when uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, when he was the candidate first, in America, this was discussed. Can the Americans trust a Catholic who would be loyal to the Pope? So things like this are to be found in many parts of the world. The thing is that uh, in the subcontinent, we must look at the counter evidence as well. And I've said that if the Hindu right can only talk of the Muslims persecuting, to, persecuting Hindus, then how do they explain that only about 19 to 20% of the Indian population converted to Islam. If Islam had been so terribly oppressive, there should have been no Hindu left. And of course, then the counter argument is that Hindu culture is so strong that there was no chance that whatever terror the Muslims had used would break them down. I mean, there is no way of dealing with this. The question, I think the what we can, just looking at the partition, uh, maybe I should have mentioned it, but in such a great hurry, one is always worried about the time. Just as Alama Iqbal and, and Chaudhary Tehmatali were saying this, Hindutva was already coined in 1923 by Savarkar. And in 1937, he says that uh, uh, it's the, that some of our 
friends because of their naivety believe Hindus and Muslims can be one nation. They can never be one nation. So now if the Hindu right also had come to this conclusion, then uh, who is to be blamed for the partition if the Muslim League started gaining grounds on it? Uh, in 1938, Gavalkar is on record saying that we should learn from the Germans what they have done to the Jews. And uh, non-Hindus shall have no rights in India. They will not even have second uh, class rights. They must only accept Hindu domination. I think that's also an equal provocation to demand partition. But I suppose the Hindu right would argue that they now they say that Gandhi and Nehru are responsible for agreeing to the partition. But the way I understand, their arguments also demand a partition. But one partition in which all Muslims are also driven out of India. So I think that's the difference. And uh, so their grievances are, why did Gandhiji and Nehru and other Congress leaders didn't force the Muslims across the border into, into Pakistan. And uh, the question is, the, the irony, the tragedy is that if Pakistan was created for the Indian Muslims, would Jinnah had agreed to the partition? Because, you know, in 1941 at Kanpur, he's on record saying, I'll have these two crore Muslims smashed. Uh, you know, for him, getting India partition was the most important thing. And he had no plans for the Muslims of the subcontinent, how to resolve their problems and issues. He, in fact, greatly compounded their problems by dividing them between India and Pakistan. So this is the tragedy. Uh, the, for example, the Hindu right says that the Congress leaders followed a pol policy of appeasement of Muslims and they want to undo it. So their secularism would mean uh, an even-handed treatment of all minorities. And I've said appeasement, I don't understand how that works out because if the uh, uh, such a report is to be believed, apart from this small, tiny minority of upper, upper class, upper caste Muslims, most Indian Muslims are just above the Dalits in terms of their social status, and their economic situation. So that appeasement argument doesn't hold. Then they even <laughs> argue that we have the same DNA, which I think is absolutely correct. I have had my DNA <laughs> examined and it's 93.1% South Asian. South Asian, you know, has three categories, Indo-Aryan, Indo-Dravidian, and Indo-Tibetan. Then I'm 7.6% Central Asian because when the people came they, to the plains of Punjab, they must have left their imprint on, on the Punjab also. And I'm 1.1% West uh, uh, Asian. So some ancestor, maybe, who knows from where, did come to the subcontinent. But whosoever came to the subcontinent stayed here and became part of it and belongs to the subcontinent. After all, Akbar, when he invaded India, he didn't come and fight a Hindu. He fought uh, Lodi, Sikandar Lodi, and defeated him. Similarly, when Nadir Shah came to the subcontinent, it's he who bled daily white, you know, and 30,000 people were killed when the ruler was a Mughal emperor. So there is no evidence that 
Muslims as a whole have been oppressing Hindus, but that imperialism is a fact. Whosoever comes, comes and wants to establish his power. And in doing so, they humiliate the local population, but that you can't go back and now undo the humiliation of the past. After all, the Mughal Empire had, uh, even during the time of Aurangzeb, the percentage of Muslim of Hindus serving in the in the imperial army was greater than when they were serving during the time of Akbar. So, applying the principles and the practices of the past to the modern period of one man, one vote, equal representation is a flawed argument. So I don't know, I can only give you intellectually reasonable arguments, but when it's a question of emotions and hatred, I have no recipe to, to, to offer to you. I mean, that's my limitation. That's your limitation. What to do? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh... Uh, I will request my comrades Bhargav to take up some questions in the chat box. Bhargav, please. Yeah, I will do. Thank you so much. And I um, will just uh, go through them. Uh, uh, good evening and thank you, Professor Ishtiak uh, for this wonderful and uh, illuminating descriptive uh, account of the uh, problematic past. There is a question from Simon who is initially Jinnah support two nation theory or later he support this movement because when Chowdhury Rahmat Ali coined the um, acronym of Pakistan, Jinnah called him. Uh, it indicates that Jinnah was not in support of two nation theory initially. It was later happened when National Congress ignores him. Is it, is it true? Well, it is true that uh, although Jinnah had a lot of grievances, personal grievances against Gandhi and even Nehru and so on, uh, he didn't have an outlet for them. Uh, but, uh, and of course, Chaudhary Rahmat Ali preceded him with all these arguments. And during that period, he just uh, ridiculed Chaudhary Rahmat Ali as a, as a college boy or whatever. But then after the 1937 election, when, uh, you see why I didn't take it up because Indian historians are very sensitive about it, that before the elections, they say there was some gentleman's agreement in the UP that irrespective of what result emerges from the election, <laughs> Congress and Muslim League together will form the government in the UK. But after the results showed that the Muslims had not voted for the Muslim League in any significant way, the Congress uh, went back on this uh, agreement, gentleman's agreement, whatever you want to call it. My Indian colleagues say that there was no such agreement. It's something which Chaudhary Khaliku Zuman, a UP Muslim leaguer, came up with. But the older sources do point out something about it. I have, I'm going to, in my new book on the partitions of India, Punjab, and Bengal, quote Jinnah. Actually, I've done it already in the Jinnah book where he says that we were looking for uh, cooperation with the Congress but they have rejected it and now we will you know and then he says to the Muslims you either uh, uh, now take up you know the cudgels against the Congress or you will perish so at that point Jinnah becomes the most vociferous ardent unflinching relentless supporter of the two nation theory. So yes, Jinnah was a late arrival, but my point is it's only when he became the leader that an idea which had been in the air since the second half of the 19th century moved 
from the periphery to the center of politics. So that's the big difference. Uh, we have with us Professor Dolores, uh, and she has raised some question uh, in the chat box itself, but I would request her to uh, raise it herself. Professor Dolores. Please. You're, you're mute. You're mute, Professor. Okay, I'm trying to unmute, yes. Uh, hey, uh, I, I feel uh, sort of uh, embarrassed in such a gathering where we have so much knowledge, but I mean, Ishtia, I'm sure one could go on listening for hours and hours and so often when you say things. So, I mean, I am a professor of history. I do teach South Asia, but there are so many holes in information. So first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this. And as I put in chat, you know, you're very aware of this, and there have been articles written, you know, the Isha Jalal thesis, and of course, then your book, right? So, uh, kind of just encapsulate uh, for me and possibly other listeners on the call, uh, um, you know, what, what, what you've said to some extent rebut Dalal what she has said, right? But if you could in a couple of sentences just um, uh, encapsulate the main difference. Uh, and sorry for asking such a kind of uh, perhaps. No, no, I think, you know, I have avoided taking up Aisha Jalal because I don't want people to think that I'm, you know, out there to run her down. Uh, although she doesn't make she runs down everyone, but I thought I wouldn't do it. But let me say like this, I think her PhD thesis, if examined against, would be rejected. Because a thesis which is not looking at existing evidence is a dishonest undertaking. You know, there are two big sins in, in academics. One is when you write and I publish it, in my name, that is plagiarism. The second is when you have a phony thesis and you just ignore all the evidence which flies in the face of it. What I have done is I've sat down, look at the title of the book, the sole spokesman, Jinnah, the demand for Pakistan and, and huh? the sole spokesman. Spokesman means somebody who spoke, doesn't it? So how can you have such a title and then never quote even one speech of Jinnah from 1940 when he made this uh, uh, 22nd March presidential address till 1947 when Pakistan came into being? So what was Jinnah doing? What did he say? What are his standpoints? I have actually people have complained that this is over reference I've given, but I've done it because I don't want to give any scope to anyone to challenge the fact that Jinnah after the 22nd of March, 1947, never ever even obliquely, remotely uh, <laughs> suggested that he wanted India to remain united and that he would be willing to share power uh, in a united India at all. On the contrary, you have all the speeches and several times he's on record saying that this idea that I'm using the demand for Pakistan as a bargaining ploy is Congress propaganda. So he alleges that the Congress people are saying this. He, he wants partition and he'll work for the partition. Even when the cabinet mission plan, I mean, that's the that's where she comes up that look, he, he was waiting until an, an equation came and then he accepted it. Now let me put it on record. The cabinet mission plan came in March 1920, uh, 9, 1946, started meeting people from the, from the 4th of April, and when they met Jena on the 4th of April, I think 2nd of April, 4th of April, when they met, first they met Mahatma Gandhi, then, he, then they met uh, Jena. They told Mr. Jena, look, if you can't show us 
that East and West Pakistan can be defensible. You leave us no choice but to leave India united. Now it's at that point that Jinnah must have realized that either accept this cabinet mission plan because the cabinet mission plan had rejected the demand for Pakistan saying that in West Pakistan there will be 37% Hindus and Sikhs and 48% uh, Hindus in East Pakistan, such a state would be no partition at all. I mean, it wouldn't be a Muslim state in that sense. So that was not workable. So instead, they came up with these three groups, A, B, and C. A were Hindu majority provinces. B were Muslim majority provinces of Northwestern India. And C were Muslim majority province of Eastern India, yeah, Eastern zone of India. Now the thing is, in Punjab, the Sikhs came out with a statement, we don't want to be part of the group B. And the Khudai Khidmatgar, 94% Muslim majority province said, we don't want to be part of group B. So already this scheme which the British had prepared to please just the Muslim League, because the Congress was not in favor of these groupings. They wanted an effective center with substantial, uh, you know, subjects given to the provinces. According to the Nehru report and so on and so forth, they even agreed to many other subsequent demands. But Jeddah wanted 50-50% representation in the cabinet. Now, how is that possible? For 25% of the population, getting double the representation. So all these were unreasonable once you grant universal adult franchise. So Aisha Jalal ignores all the speeches and so on and says, look, didn't he accept the cabinet mission plan? And I've said the day he accepted the cabinet mission plan on the 6th of June, 1947, he, he's on record in, this, in that speech saying to the Council Muslim League, this was in camera, saying, Pakistan remains our goal, but we may not get it tomorrow, but we will work towards it. And remember, every 10 years, the cabinet mission plan has a clause which says that the provinces or the groups can opt out of India. So uh, Jinnah did not accept it. Initially, he rejected the cabinet mission plan. But then finally, when he accepted it, in order to convince the Muslim leaguers to accept it, he said, no, no, the, the goal remains Pakistan, but not tomorrow. We'll work towards it. As we are there, we'll see to it that the whole system doesn't work and we get Pakistan. So I have said that Jinnah accepted uh, the cabinet mission plan, not because that is what he wanted all along and had been saying contrary things, but the option was either to accept the cabinet mission plan or leave India united as the British cabinet mission plan delegates to, uh, told him. Now, all that is missing in her book. I think it is untenable academically. Uh, and I have, I have requested friends, urged friends, she and I can have a sitting together and we can sort it out. And she runs away from it. And here's another platform where I'm offering the same thing. Because she has nothing to stand on. How did Cambridge pass such a thesis so poorly? So, I mean, it's not substantiated at all in the thesis it proposes. I think it's a scandal. So that's the big difference. And one thing more, her position is challenged even in India by many reputable scholars and I can name them, but in Pakistan, it is a heresy to say that Jinnah didn't want partition. Uh, they didn't want Pakistan. For them, Pakistan was impossible without Jinnah, the great Marde Momin, the great Marde Kamil. These are the Islamic titles for the hero who wins. So nobody who seriously looks at the material can ever accept it. It's only people who have gone to Cambridge and that connection who for some reason 
think that he was a leftist and i've quoted in my book if you want i can read it again 19th march 1944 at lahore he says hands off hands off you communists you think we are fools perhaps we are but we have our i warn you we have our own islamic ideology we don't want any red or any yellowism out from the muslim league and yet the communist party of india in its gross stupidity had passed a resolution supporting the right of oppressed nationalities to self determination which was a very bizarre way of supporting the two nation theory because uh, if you look at the adhikari report which is also given in the book the the nationalities mentioned are all the na- linguistic nationalities sindhis bengalis marathis odishas gujaratis you name them they are all there but when it comes to punjab when it comes to punjab it says uh, uh, sikhs and muslims so instead of saying punjabis which would include punjabi hindus the oppressed nationalities are sikhs and and muslims and that's what the muslim league was wanting to divide india to create pakistan the sikhs were not in favor of it so the the communist party of india's greatest unforgivable blunder is to support uh, the two nation theory on such a dubious ground as oppressed nationalities and so some people with a leftist sort of commitment would rather blame nehru and gandhi for the partition uh, and so on so these are the different angles of it uh, i hope please, i answered your question please thank thank you thank you i i don't know if people can hear me or not there seems to be a problem with my screen but thank you so much maybe after uh, jalal's uh, sort of personal uh, a uh, friendship with the boss family one would have hoped she would have revised her her thesis because you quoted nitaji uh, boss on on this yeah thank you uh before i take up other questions in the chat box i will invite uh, anand patwardhan is here anand patwardhan to 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 say a few words anand i am all ears for you i am in no hurry so you can have as many questions yeah yeah, please. yeah, yeah. thank you thank you yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, anand i i Are you able to hear me? No, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Hi, hi. Um, can can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. So I wanted more light shed on the rumors. Uh, sometimes there are rumors. Sometimes somebody people have even put it in films about a secret pact between Jinnah and Churchill long before partition. which people say have was was had taken place which finally led to I me mean, i'm not sh- I'm saying it was instrumental necessarily as a uh, for what happened in the end but it it is part of the process but there is very little is talked about it maybe there's no hard evidence i i would like yeah yeah to the thing about. is that i think in hindi urdu hindustani we say that the cat teaches all tricks to the lion but not to climb the tree isn't it <laughs> so the british i'm sure did a lot of such mischief but they have not written down it in a documents form so that's one problem the thing is there is enough evidence now emerging and i've documented this in in my book where churchill support for pakistan at least dates from 1943 one would say even earlier and that is when a british journalist famous journalist comes to india and and meets jena and and he says a meeting with a giant this is the title of the chapter he wrote where uh gan when churchill then says he has read the book and sends this book to his wife saying after reading the book i am convinced that 
Jinnah and the Muslims are entitled to a Pakistan. Okay. So publicly, this is on record, 1943. There is a book uh, by a British author. Martin is his surname, I think. And I've quoted that as well, saying that in 1944, when Lord Wavell went to the UK to consult the government before he called the Shimla conference, uh, Churchill is reportedly said to have said to him, give me a bit of India. So here is another bit of evidence that he wanted the partition of India. I think had Churchill remained in power as prime minister, things would have been very different. But in 1945, he lost the elections. And uh, once he had lost the elections, he could not have done the favors he may have done had he remained the prime minister of the UK. The Labour government wanted to leave India because American pressure was so considerable. You know, the Americans were paying the salaries of British officers. They were The British were literally bankrupt and American pressure was, you leave the subcontinent. So uh, it's not just a rumor, it's a fact. I've even quoted Jinnah in the book saying, people say that I am in touch with Mr. Jinnah, but I'm in touch with Mr. Jinnah because he's leader of the opposition. So he has a right to know exactly what is going on here as much as the British government. So that's the third admission. And on the whole, uh, it is Churchill who formulated the policy that in order to counter the Indian National Congress, promote the British, uh, pr promote the Muslim League. And this is what the Viceroy Lilithgow started doing. So all the evidence is there that Churchill was very sympathetic to Pakistan. And in the end, his opinion, I think, must have played a very important role because the Americans wanted India to remain united when made independent. But at the last moment, and in June 1947, I've quoted a letter of the British government to the Americans that saying that we are now going to partition India. And so as late as that are the Americans informed. So who then wanted the partition? The Americans didn't, Aji. The Congress didn't. Uh, the Muslim League did. But then if the Muslim League was going to get India partitioned, the Congress, the Sikhs, the Hindu Masaba wanted the Muslim majority provinces partitioned as well. And that's what emerged finally. So definitely Churchill's support for Jinnah was there. Actual documents substantiating this are difficult to find. There is, I've read somewhere that there was a, a housekeeper or someone, a lady, through whom Churchill and, Gan and Jinnah were corresponding. But what correspondence took place? Where are those papers? Up until now, they are still classified. Yes, uh, Shukla Sen. Uh, Shukla Sen has raised his hand. Uh, can I, can I, Shukla Sen, can you, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Please. Have I unmuted myself? Yeah, 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 yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, actually, I wanted to ask a subsidiary question. Uh, Professor Ahmed made in passing, only in passing, a very interesting comment that Congress on 9th August 1942 did pass the Quit India Resolution under the pressure from Shubhash Chandra Bose who had already left India and by that time he was probably in Singapore or wherever. Fine. So I would uh, request him to elaborate a bit 
if possible. That's all. Uh, thank you very much. You see, al already there was a problem between Gandhi ji and Subhash Chandra Bose from 1938 when uh, Bose already was in favor of some sort of armed resistance and so on and so forth. At that point, Gandhi ji had him removed as president and then we know he left India. But his influence in Bengal and in Bihar, parts of Bihar, had already grown over, uh, over time. And then the fact that uh, uh, the Japanese, at least in the early part of 1942, were, were uh, winning the war, it seemed, and moving towards the subcontinent, all this made the idea of an armed resistance to overthrow British rule popular in the masses. And so I think Gandhi and others who had up until then been opposing the use of, you know, mass action and so on to overthrow. Overthrow would include some sort of use of force, uh, uh, British rule, then succumbed to this pressure. And the Quit India movement, I think, came out of it. And it was a major disaster. Because what I think we all have to at some point address, I wish I had another lifetime to do it, but won't have it, is how come 100,000 Englishmen could rule 400 million Indians who were willing to whip them, shoot them, put them in jail, hang them, and still the Union flag, uh, you know, the British could rule India. Somehow, this whole idea of patriotism and so on, we have to revisit how much of it was really there among our people. I think the caste differences, the cult differences, the religious differences, the sectarian differences, not religion only, all these other differences really did obstruct the emergence of a, a egalitarian, horizontal idea of a, a nation of equal citizens. It's Such ideas came from the top downwards. Nobody in the masses was looking for all these freedoms which were given in the Indian constitution. They were done by the enlightened sections of the Congress leaders. So to, to respond to your question, uh, that's my take. I think uh, Subhash Chandra Bose's uh, radicalism, his call for use of force and so on had become so strong that uh, uh, the Congress made this decision which came to haunt it. Bargo, please. Yeah, there is, uh, 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 let, me, let me go to chat box and there is a question. There are few questions waiting. Uh, uh, first, I would like to bring to your notice a question posed by uh, Mr. Razi Razi Uddin. Um, his question follows like this. Ishtiak Sahib did not mention anything on the fears of insecurity of Indian subcontinent Muslims as a minority. There were multiple Zenine issues on which Congress was open or committed. While totally opposed to the idea of Pakistan or of Muslim League, here the argument and onus was totally put on Zinna as a militant crusader rather than a reasoned argument as to why many secular Muslim leaders were also pressing for it in that time. You have read it too fast and not loud enough. Could you please do it slowly and I'll loud and loud? I will do that. Sorry, sorry for the inconvenience, and uh, I'll do that, sir. Yes. Tiyak Sahib did not mention anything on the fears of insecurity of Indian subcontinents, Muslims as a minority. Okay. There were multiple Zenine issues on which Congress was not neither open nor com committed. While totally opposed to the idea of Pakistan or of Muslim League, 
Here, the argument and onus was totally put on Jinnah as a militant crusader mm. rather than a reasoned argument. Then why many secular Muslim leaders were also pressing for it in the, at that time? I don't know who are the secular Muslims who were pressing for it because Jinnah himself, according to these people, was a secular leader. And to me, it makes no sense that a secular leader, simply because he dresses up in a Western way and has a ham sandwich becomes secular. That's like saying that, you know, uh, Hitler was a vegetarian. And if that were dietary habits were the basis of one's ideology, then he would have been the most peace loving man on earth. So I don't understand how secular, which secular Muslims did he have in mind who were uh, in favor of the partition? except those who joined the Communist Party and were sent by the Communist Party to support Pakistan. I'll tell you the reason for that. We'll come to whether the Muslim fears were genuine about and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've forgotten what I wanted to say. I think I'll remember and, and, and take it up again. But which fears of the Muslims did the Congress not take care of? In 1931, you see, in 1931, in March, at Karachi, the Indian National Congress adopted the fundamental rights. Okay, But these were rights based on the liberal individual citizenship claims, upon which conservative Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims said that they want guarantees that their own personal law will be uh, protected in a united India. And in 1931, I have quoted in my Jinnah book, Congress's resolution saying that the minority, although fundamental rights would apply to all citizens, but minorities will have a right to apply their personal law to their internal personal affairs. And that became a problem later on for Nehru and, and as we know now, when the Shah Bano case came up and instead of Shah Bano being granted the allowance which all Indian divorced women who had no economic way of supporting themselves were entitled, uh, when she demanded, the Muslims came out against her and Rajiv Gandhi then had to revert the law of the Supreme Court, which I think was a very enlightened law, saying that in Islam, justice is the principle. And so this poor woman has the right to be supported. So, but uh, to say that the Congress didn't take care of Muslim interest is nonsense. Give me one concrete example of which interest you have in mind, and I will respond to it. Just making a sweeping statement is not very helpful. Muslim personal law was granted by the 1931 resolution and it became part of the Indian constitution, which is now a problem for, the, for that constitution where the uniform civil code is one thing and this exceptionalism for Muslims has become a problem. It's the other way around. Uh, so maybe I will have, instead of all the things he has taken up, he can respond to my, give me a, con a concrete example of, of the Congress not responding to Muslim fears. What other fears were there which the Congress was not accommodating? Please give an example. Uh, For example, when it came to the national language, I have told you that they said there will be Hindustani with two official scripts, Devanagari and and. Uh, Urdu Persian script. So both language, both scripts were given equal status. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> what more? I mean, if exceptionalism was also granted personal law, then what, what is left? Uh, that was not. Uh, Rajiv Rajiv Sahib wants to respond to your uh, question uh, to, to, to answer. Rajiv Sahib, please. Can you unmute yourself? 
Oh, he's not, he's not there, he's not there. So uh, we have with us uh, a leading academician from Andhra Pradesh, uh, Professor Melkote Rama, if he wants to uh, say something. Yes. Please. Please unmute yourself, Professor. Yeah. Please. Thank you so much for that very, very... I, I really feel enlightened because the way we have been taught history and understood history and whatever has been written, you mentioned Aisha Jalal, we've read all those. But I always felt, you know, that there is something more to this whole history of partition which may not have come out because... Um, as I said, I'm not a historian. Many things may have missed my uh, comprehension. But one thing that as a political scientist, I always felt that the whole question of class has never been really addressed in any of these, uh, uh, you know, these uh, writings. When you're talking about, you talked about identities now, which have become so central to politics and political discourse, etc. I, I do feel very strongly that if one had addressed the question of class along with identities, along with all these, you know, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, et cetera, et cetera, probably our understanding would have been much better, much deeper, instead of just pushing the whole question of class out. You also mentioned about Russia and, uh, you know, uh, how the British saw uh, Pakistan as uh, being with the West, you know, capitalism, West, etc. And India would probably go to adopt the Russian model, etc. Now, these are so important, which are never talked about, which are hardly ever discussed in the this thing. And this kind of an understanding and the kind of power politics that Britain played in this uh, are so very important to understand what what happened. We may never know what exactly happened because history is always, you know, as more and more you get, more information you get, more uh, details you get, you're likely to change your perspective or, you know, you, you revise your perspectives. So in that sense, I find your talk was so very enlightening to me, you know, but maybe, you know, much more needs to be done. Um, in terms of how did the, uh, it may be very difficult to do it now because we don't have those people who were part of the partition history, et cetera. How did the common man think about it? Common woman, common people. When we use people, the word people, it's a very you know general term. But how did the um, you know ordinary people, the I wouldn't say working class or you know, but people right at the bottom, the subalterns. How did they understand this whole question of partition? How did they understand this? Uh, uh, you know, what was their response to these partition? We may never know. I don't know. Maybe you know more um, subaltern histories might bring if you have material and things. Today we can do oral histories about caste and so many things, but that part of Partition history is very difficult even today, but we need to keep our minds open and say that, after all, you can't blame only Jinnah or only Nehru. Today, it's become a fashion to blame Nehru for every, every ill in the country. So in that sense, I find your talk so very absorbing. Thank you so much. That was very kind of you, madam. Let me just add that uh, <clears throat> about what common people felt. Uh, you see, the franchise granted under, under the 1935 Act and which applied even in the 1946 election was 10-11% only. Mm -hmm. So common people didn't have a right to vote yeah. till the very end. The right universal adult franchise was never considered by the British at all. Strangely enough, they granted it to, to Ceylon, Sri Lanka in 1932, just next door. But when it came to the subcontinent, they wouldn't do it. Although both the Muslim League, sorry, Congress and after that even Muslim League 
mentioned universal adult franchise later on i i have in the manifestos and so on the muslim league doesn't make a big point of it but the congress always did universal adult franchise universe but only 10 11% of the population had the right to vote and these were people who had who paid a certain level of uh, revenue based on land ownership and uh, had a certain level of education i think graduation or fa pass or something so it was a restricted uh, uh suffrage granted now who are the people one the question people have posed okay in the muslim majority provinces maybe they started feeling that once the hindus and sikhs are gone the whole field would be left vacant for us to make progress because we are academically educationally behind hindus and sikhs uh, we are nowhere in the business sector or in commerce and so on so we'll get an opportunity you know in those sectors of the economy as well so pakistan becoming attractive to the common person let's say in the muslim majority provinces one can think in rational terms but this would not apply to the muslims of the hindu majority provinces but the thing is it was not clear what will be the future final shape of the partition because exchange of population was mentioned once in after i think uh, september or november 1946 by 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 jena when uh, the massacre of muslims took place in bihar first it was calcutta 16th august then it went to noakhali and then it went to bombay and bihar and but afterwards somebody must have told jena that look we may only be able to throw out 5.6 million hindus and sikhs from west punjab but india can expel 35 million muslims from there so keep quiet demand the partition but not exchange of population so there is no mention of an exchange of population the british didn't consider it for the common for the uh, congress gandhi nehru especially azad the whole idea of pushing out muslims was anathema from their ideology but when it comes to the common people whether hindu sikh or muslim nobody was consulted but one can assume that most people were charmed by gandhi ji and then later on even in punjab i am told jinnah sahab's call for creating a pakistan based on the model of prophet muhammad's state where you know injustices will come to an end everybody will be answerable including the khalifa and so on must have attracted people and they supported it even if they didn't have the right to vote uh, but all this please. is is a matter of speculation here radhi rajudin sahab is back uh, can you get please, please your response in brief sir yeah which uh, one yeah uh, well i made some comment but uh, i'm also lost with many other response responses that i just heard um the thing that i wanted to say is that first of all let me clarify i come from a very left eastern congressy family zero to do with muslim league of pakistan my grandfather was so opposed to it that he stopped sending his children to aligarh for a while so mm -hmm. let's go from that eastern point uh, but you see the, the we were talking about the wider division which we see right now in india Mm. and which we see almost every time in pakistan that hindus and muslims somehow uh, it's not that they've just popped up this uh, this distrust or division it it was simmering since long time and mm. there were issues some real issues jina was not suddenly 
this came up with a very uh, separate idea of exclusive Muslim uh, land. It was it was there simmering in, among Hindus and among Muslims, and okay. there were genuine there yes, were genuine, yes. What what I am hearing, and I think uh, you you gave a, uh, gave us a talk one and a half year back on Indian diaspora, and uh, we invited you, and there also the idea to show uh, that Jina alone was more militantly pushing for a separate Muslim land. But in Muslim League, there were not, in spite of all, nothing to do with Muslim League, I'll say there were a lot of Muslim Leagues who had, who were not communal at all, who were very, very secular minded. And they, they were also fed up probably with the indifference shown by Congress and it's a, it's a little a sense of arrogance was there. Which okay, they, I think they, I do. You, you are not uh, actually addressing the concerns of almost 35% of a population in the subcontinent Muslims, that they were scared of a clear cut things shown to them that they will be just a citizen and it is possible that in a minority they will be just um, okay, just... okay. Uh, Razi so, sahab, I, I agree, I agree. But then do you think the solution would be if such a fear existed? Should there have no, been an exchange of population? No, 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 no. Not, let's come to, I mean, saying that they had talking, genuine fears. Yeah, if you are talking about at division. I'm not talking about division at all. I am talking about Gandhi I'm saying, and Nehru and others who were very capable of sitting with them and not thinking Nehru, not thinking as a liberal democrat sitting in London. He, he ignored, in spite of the best pro-Muslim personality in the subcontinent, he ignored, he never took con into consideration of large Muslim populations, what they are thinking, how their genuine concerns are, whether they will be getting reservation. Look, this Dalit reservation was not suddenly a sudden factor. It was in the cooking. They were thinking that these, after the independence, we will give some reservation to this minority. So what, yes, about, yes. what about the Pasmanda Muslims, which now BJP is exploiting to its credit uh, and uh, to its uh, um, benefit, but what about at that time, Ahrars and others, large population of Muslims who unwillingly had to go and migrate to Pakistan? But no concern was showed to their language. No concern was showed to how, their... How? Sir, listen, please. I mean, when you are saying this, have you read my Jinnah book since then, Bhai sir? Because you did me a great favor of inviting me and then... I made it's a humble request only, yaar, kitab bhi padh lo na, meri. Sorry, it's not only your book. Of course, I read Mushur Hassan's process. <laughs> Mushur Hassan's very nee, pehle, aap ye batahe, aapne meri kitab padhi hai. Aapki kitab bhi padhi hai, aisi baat na <laughs> hai, nahi padhi hai. But <laughs> I'm, I'm not going into personal things like, you know, nee, who's... Nee, personal nahi hai, maiz toh samaj nahi aari, ke <laughs> musulmano ke jo fears the, maslan, so you are you are just actually not taking into consideration of the real issue, which was the fear psychosis of what Muslims. fears were there? What that fears? Well, you are not Hinduism. 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 Yeah, one, Hinduism. By one. one by one, please. Fears. Ki koi bhi yani genuinely, koi objectively fears kya the? So you think oh. there were no fear of Muslim? Uh, and no sense of all these disturbance, ki what will happen at the uh, independence, they will be reduced to a minority without having any real representation. But that is right. If they, if they fear this, then... But that's, this not the, the, but that's not the reality of politics of a population. If there is a, in a country, if there a genuine percentage of population, is used to a certain but, but way. Uh, Rajiv sir, let's let Ishtiaks have respond and let us move on. 
Let yeah. the have respond and then move on. Yeah, my response is that I'm deeply aware of the fact that the Muslims lagged behind the Hindus and and let's say even the Sikhs in Punjab. Uh, and so I've even explained how in 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 Punjab where there was no support for the Muslim League, once this call to create a riyasat e Medina was given and the ulema, you know, I didn't go into those details. The things they said there, Razi Saab, I don't know if he has seen them. They made a category that any Muslim who did not vote for the Muslim League would be denied an Islamic burial. Any Muslim who did not vote for the Muslim League, his nikah, his marriage will be annulled. And they made a category that voting for Pakistan is voting for the Holy Prophet, voting for uh, the Punjab Unis Party led by Sir Khizar Hayat Tiwana was voting for Baldev Singh and, and the Sikhs. You know, with such fears being created by the Muslim League and promises being made that in Pakistan, uh, all that you have missed spiritually and materially will be compensated was a great attraction. And so Pakistan attracted these people. I'm saying Jinnah should then have ensured that all the Muslims who wanted to join Pakistan could do that. But he said that he will get two crore Muslims smashed and have them taste martyrdom. Who is the one who ignored their worries? Did the Congress ignore their worries? Who gave them a constitution where there are equal rights, where they even accepted, and I think this has become a problem, Muslim personal law? Who had a better approach to the Muslim concerns? I would still... Okay, now Pakistan came into being. Was the Muslim League's promises kept? Not at all. As soon as Pakistan came into being, the divisions within Muslims came to the fro. Shia Sunni differences start from the time the Prophet died. From that day onwards, the two have different heroes, different uh, villains. Their kalma is maybe is different, azan definitely is different. Within the Sunni majority, you have the Barelvi who hate the Wahhabi. The Wahhabi hates Barelvi, Dhyobandi. So all these divisions have come uh, to the front in Pakistan. The minorities who stayed on in Pakistan, how have they been treated? There were Anglo-Indians, Parsis. I used to see them in Lahore. None of them is there. Nobody has stayed on in Pakistan. So Pakistan, created for the Muslims, had nothing to do with the Muslims of India. In 1972, when Zede Bhutto went to Shimla to get the 94,000 Muslim leaguers, uh, uh, POWs released, the Pakistan army gave him a memorandum that under no circumstance are you to accept that Biharis who had fought for Pakistan against the Bengalis are to be accepted in Pakistan. So does Pakistan care for Indian Muslims? Did Jinnah care for Indian Muslims anymore? I, I don't find the alternative that you have in mind convincing at all. I have zero to do with Jinnah or Pakistan. You keep on coming at Pakistan level. I'm talking about very heavy partition. I'm talking at nothing at all about Pakistan. Or but China. then, but let me argue like this. Why didn't the Muslims then of all those who were worried leave for India, except those intelligentsia who came to Karachi believe, and took up all Muslims, the jobs, all the Muslims, jobs? No, Muslims didn't believe. Many Muslims didn't believe in Pakistan at all. That's Many right. Muslims. So good. So this, this is the wrong concept. That no, I'm not that, saying they did. 
I am saying their worries. What were the worries then? They started. They stayed on in India. They given a chance. They stayed on in India. Isn't that that they wanted to remain where they were born and brought up? What the Hindu right is now doing is what the Hindu right is now doing is morally indefensible. Uh, That's a different just, matter. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's move ahead. Let's this debate we'll to continue. Uh, uh, Anand Patwardhan has raised his hand to has to has to say something. Anand, can you can you just be very brief, very brief, please? Um, well, I, I generally I like to talk a lot, but I do uh, take some objection to the characterization of the 1942 movement as a failure, the Quit India movement as a failure. Uh, I think that. People don't know enough about what was happening at that time. Look at the different positions that emerged at, in that period. You have at one extreme Subhash Bose who finally joins Hitler and Hirohito in the fight against the British. You have, on the other hand, you have Gandhi who is saying that give us independence first and then we'll be part of your struggle. Hmm. And then the, the split away from, uh, I mean, while Gandhi and all the leadership is arrested in, in that period, as soon as they make the announcement of Quit India, there is a whole section that goes underground and that fights underground in a heroic way. Thousand, I'm not, I'm not sure thousand because it's not properly documented, but maybe thousands of people died in that Quit India movement struggle. They did. They did. I agree. And, and, and there were parts of Maharashtra that were liberated. There were parts of the, many parts of the country that was in... Uh, you know, this they were a huge headache to the British. Uh, you even include in this the the mutiny that took place, which finally might have been the last straw that made Britain the naval British. the naval the yeah, uprising the naval of the naval. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, so I, I, all, I, and then at the same time, you have to take the role of the Communist Party at the time. The Communist Party was very con not confused, but they went from the imperialist war to. Uh, people's war because at one point when Stalin has a pact with Hitler, they consider this to be. I know that. Yeah, I so mean, I know. I know. And, and, and yeah. that, yeah, but so if you talk about the failure of the 42 movement, it's partly because the communists were not but on the let, side of people fighting. No, I'll let, let's see now. The why I say that the uh, this quit India movement was a failure because launching it greatly helped. Jena make a breakthrough and, and, and the partition took place. For three years, you see, in politics, there is no vacuum. If you're not there, somebody comes and fill it, fills it. So and it was not done by it was not done by intention, but that's the unintended consequence. Oh, of and the even someone like Allah Baksh is part of 42 movement. Uh, and, and yeah, but, yes, yes, I know, I know. <laughs> they were all there. They were all there, but it was also smashed. Isn't that yes, true? Yes, but what I'm saying is that the re, the communists not backing the socialist forty two movement was part of the whole problem. Yeah, it was a problem. It was a problem. I'll tell you who all did not support the Quit India movement. The Akali Dal and the Sikhs are very sensitive when you point out. They were opposed to it because after 1925, when this uh, Gurdwara movement had begun and some riots had taken place. Recruitment of the Sikhs had been slowed down. But during the Second World War, it had been opened again. And the Quit India movement wanted none of the people to join the army. So they were against it. The Hindu Masaba was against it. Yeah, of course. The Muslim League was against it. The princes were against it. And 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 uh, uh, who is that? Muslim League, did I mention, was against it. So they were the only the party then which was in favor of this was the Indian National Congress and all of them landed up in jail, uh, in, in confinement. So that's right. the sad part of it. Sad part of it. Please, no, not one on one, one. Please, Anand, please. No, no, please. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, we, I will request Abdul Mukdir Saab to, to raise his question. Very brief, very brief. Mute. You're mute, sir. Good, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. And I especially thank uh, 
new socialist initiative for arranging this program. And of course, Dr. Ishtiak Ahmed, who is a very respected person. And I have, uh, Dr. Ishtiak, uh, I have read and, and, and followed uh, many books on the partition of India and Gina, mostly Stanley Walpert and then Judith Brown. And also I recently brought your book, uh, Gina, uh, as follies and and successes, uh, and I'm starting reading on that. So, what? Uh, let me come to my question, which is basically about Jinnah. I mean, I have tried to read and find uh, there is a gap after 1930 when he uh, looked like he disgusting left India uh, after finding uh, Gandhi uh, himself underdog uh, with Gandhi's personality there. So uh, nobody knows. Uh, during his dark period in England, whether he was pampered by the British colonists to break India into this divide between Hindu and Muslims, or what was going on, or did they pump money with him? Do have you any idea about his dark period of that, of those after between 1934 and until he came back to India? Thank you, sir. Your take. This, this is a very good question. The thing is, let me give my own experience. I once sent someone in London to go and make inquiries. And I was told either that person is lying or lied to me or this is true. He said that when I went there and I tried to make inquiries about this, he was shunned from looking into those documents. So there is something oh. hidden <laughs> which is not in the public yet. The second yes. what we know about Jena is that in these three, four years, he made a fabulous amount of money uh, by going to the Privy Council and taking up cases of the rich. So this way, a lot of money was given to him. I even have evidence anecdotal, not written, that there was a mosque at uh, Woking somewhere in UK, where an assortment of people used to come including Jinnah. The Woking Mosque was established by some MD group, I think, Kadiani group. And Jinnah and a lot of people used to come and maybe that is where the British were also involved. in. But it's, it's a hushed up, hidden portion of his life where no, I have even I have even urged my British colleagues who work on these areas. Why don't you go and do research and tell us what happened those four years? We have no information. Yes, the right. No I mean, even in even in India, or I mean, I don't know how good uh, a lawyer or how much he, he was successful, but mostly what I find is that money was getting pumped from the rich, like Aga Sir Aga Khan, or the, all those sirs who were. The, uh, the patterns of the British or British who patronized them. So most of the cases in India were also getting or money was pumped by these rich uh, British patronized people. And even when he went to those dark period for years, I understand. I'm, I'm a, I mean, I'm, though I'm an uh, engineer, but I am a staunch reader of history. I've read a lot of, uh, uh, mostly Stanley Walports and other books, uh, even Judith Brown, I had it. I, I, hope, I don't know if you got a chance of reading her modern India. So, but I was unable to, because my focus was find out how this guy, guy got so rich during this period. Yeah, nobody gives you the detail. They don't let you come in. Yeah. This is because- he was a, It looks like he was a seller. You have to live, uh, you have to look at the Privy Council records and nobody has access to them. So maybe this is something uh, we will never know or maybe know in another hundred years when we are all gone, God knows. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, Dr. Shtak. I have a lot of respect and I really follow most of your YouTube channels and books and it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you. And I was, I was waiting and I requested the new socialist initiatives will let me know and they were very kind to give me the email about your coming today. Thank, thank you so you, much. Sir. Nice, nice. Thank thank you, you, you. Thank you. There is a, another question I would like to uh, bring your notice from the chat box. This is a question posed by one Mr. Deepak. Uh, his, his question is, 
Would you care to elaborate why Bengal did not see bloodbath, whereas Punjab went through hell? Yeah. Also, what made Jinnah change his views upon his return from England? About his views return from... <laughs> we, we have already touched it. <laughs> but, but why did Bengal not go through a bloodbath? First of all, the 1857 huh? uprising, freedom movement, uh, war of independence, whatever you were, was yeah. led by Bengalis and Biharis. So after that, the British put a full stop on recruiting Bengalis and Biharis into the British Indian Army. Uh, they were only recruited in engineering and medical course, but not in the fighting course. So those who were trained to fight, kill, whatever, were overwhelmingly Punjabis. So in order to second Mahatma Gandhi's, uh, you know, presence first in uh, uh, Noah Khali and then in on 15th of August 1947 in Calcutta along with Sorvardi was largely responsible for Bengal remaining peaceful during the partition. So First, Bengalis didn't have the weaponry, the know-how to use, you know, the about a million Punjabis had come back, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs, after four years of being in the trenches and killing one another could not have been a very difficult thing. Many of them were demented, I think, mentally. So in the Punjab, all those instruments of violence and terrorism existed. They only needed to be put to use and they were put to use by the different parties and so on. Largely the Muslim League and then also the uh, Sikh parties. Uh, the Congress record is relatively better, uh, largely because of Jawaharlal Nehru, I think. So that's why Bengal uh, didn't go through the same massive violence as did Punjab. Yeah, I think we should move to the conclu conclusion of the meeting. Uh, though there's, there are many hands have been raised, I would request. We know, we know. You want to say some, something? We know Mumbai. No, he's not. Uh, Anand, please. Anand Pradhan, you. वो तो कई दफा हो नहीं गया उनके साथ सवाल हो. नवीन, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, no, I don't have anything new to say. I just basically uh, just the same point. I think that uh, when we're looking at 42 movement, we should also analyze why the communists did not join the mainstream struggle at that moment against uh, for independence. And that uh, there are two reasons. Let me now elaborate two reasons. One is, of course, as you rightly point out, once it became a people's war, they became the Russians or the Soviets and the British became allies. And I'm right. sure that must have inspired them to see yeah, yeah. because it's only in 1942 that for the first time, legally, the Communist Party of India could open its offices. One. Right. The second is there was a widespread belief that a revolution in the subcontinent was being uh, uh, Subverted by Gandhi's non-violence, whereas yeah, that, in Pakistan, yeah. yeah. yes, yes, whereas in Pakistan, uh, this Islamic socialism and Muslims wanting jihad could lead yeah. towards a revolutionary Pakistan. I have given both those arguments in my Jinnah book as well as in my Punjab book. Yeah, these were the two reasons. Yeah, but at the time, even when the Bengal famine was happening, no, 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 please, Anand, please, yeah. no, no. Not uh -huh. yeah. uh, I will ask uh, Naveen to raise this question, please. Very brief, Naveen. Naveen is not there. Uh, Hello. Uh, uh, Naveen, please. Hi, Subhash. Shukriya, Shtayak Saab, for your lecture. Can you hear my voice? Yes, yes, yes. शुक्रिया बहुत आपका शुक्रिया इस वक्तव्य के लिए 
मेरे दो तीन सवाल है पहला तो पहली बात तो ये कि मैं अगर अगर पार्टीशन का की जिम्मेदारी किस पे मूलतः किस पे डाली जाए अगर इस और पार्टीशन के हवाले से बाकी सब कॉन्टिनेंट में जो राजनीति उसके बाद हुई मुझे आपकी बात से अब थोड़ा प्रोवोकेटिवली कह रहा हूँ लेकिन कोई आलोचना नहीं की तो तौर पे ना लिया जाए बल्कि चर्चा के तौर पे लिया जाए आप कह रहे हैं कि मूलतः पार्टीशन के लिए जिना और मुस्लिम लीग की राजनीति मूलतः वो उसकी जिम्मेदार थी हिंदू कॉम्युनिज्म हिंदू राइट विंग वॉज मोर एंड लेस ए रेस्पॉन्स टू दैट हैंस रेस्ट ऑफ द पॉलिटिक्स इन पोस्ट पार्टीशन सब कॉन्टिनेंट Squarely, you could make Jinnah and the Muslim League politics responsible for th- for that. I I mean, this is a provocation, but this I don't see what you were saying, which which could be correct. I'm not. Uh, that is, is it? Is it this what you were saying basically that the that the Hindu communism, Hindu right was a response to Muslim communism? No, no. Okay. What I'm saying is, I'm saying is. hindu and muslim right wing right wing two nation theory existed on both sides uh uh okay ha kya sawal ho gaya kya nahi ha main thodi do baat aur main apna usme jod jodna chahta tha dusri baat thoda time bahut zyada ho gaya hai pravin please main main chhod deta hu please please ha तो बस मैं आखिरी सवाल एक लेंगे वो भार्गव राव किन किन का राव एक प्रश्न आया हुआ है तो उनको पढ़ के हम खत्म करेंगे खत्म नहीं पढ़ेंगे राव भार्गव भार्गव योर यस 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 आई आई एम रीडिंग देयर इज अ क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम कॉम्रेड राव इज द अमेरिकन प्रेशर ऑन ब्रिटेन द मेन सोर्स ऑफ इंडियाज इंडिपेंडेंस इन 1947 एंड व्हाट इट ड्यू टू लैक ऑफ टाइम or was is the weekend of the british india state that was unable to withstand the independence movement of india along with the lurking danger of the revolutionary tide that arose out of the crisis of world war 2 which one you think is more important say it again i didn't get it and speak slowly please you yeah. know i'm very tired so i need your help know, sir sir he wants to know the question is uh, is the american pressure on the british the main source of india's independence in 1947 and was it due to lack of time for them or was it the weekend of the Brit- weekend british indian state that was unable to withstand the independence movement of india along with the lurking danger of the revolutionary tide that arose out of the world war crisis of world war second shall we say all of them together make up the cases case for the partition all of them together i think had a role to play let me put it like this had jena not demanded the partition there would be no partition but since jena wanted the partition of india the six wanted the partition of punjab the muslim league wanted the whole of punjab but they wanted india partitioned the same principle then applied to bengal uh, jina wanted the whole of bengal without partition and the hindu mahasabha and congress demanded the partition of bengal so now you but the final thing is this is what i keep telling all this sounds very good and very interesting but who had the final uh, uh, say on this who would decide and it is the british so who want who granted the partition are the british and they did it in a way it they thought it suited their interest most pakistan did ultimately play the role they had assigned them during the afghan jihad and the soviet union was brought down isn't it so so the reason why pakistan was created was uh, achieved Uh, in 1978 or during that period so pakistan was created to prevent soviet communism coming to the subcontinent and that has been successful so i don't play the blame game i just show you how these things happened and 
maybe many of these things happened without people working out the unintended consequences. The British primarily didn't ever want to leave India. I have said till 1973, they had declared they would be in India, but they had to leave. So all this happened suddenly or and and all these factors that you mentioned played a role. Ishtiaksa, Ishtiaksa, hmm. we did not intend to stop you from answering Naveen's question about Hindu, Hindu communalism. Achha. Hindu communalism was not simply a reaction. It was a parallel thing. And uh, if you look at the statements of uh, uh, Savarkar and, and uh, Gawalkar that within a united India, the Muslims, especially that they would have not no equal status, they would be subordinate to Hindus and so on. That I think is a provocation to demand the partition. What they, what they hold against the Congress is that the partition they wanted was one in which all Muslims would be eliminated from India and India would become simply a Hindu state. That didn't happen. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ishtiaq Sahab. It, it, it has been more than three hours that uh, and, yeah, and I enjoy it very much. Yeah, but you know, really, really, as a retired really. as a retired professor, yeah, yeah, we are always looking for a captive audience, and <laughs> <laughs> and okay. once you have it, you don't want to let it go. But <laughs> all good things must come to an end. Yeah. I must thank all of you for this very generous opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So much. We would like to listen to you again. Again. Uh, my pleasure, Ji. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>